There's a pretty one, Ulysses. Hello Booktube, I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Here I am with a review of a Scottish novel from 1975, Doherty by William McIlvanny. Wow, this was fantastic. I gave it four stars. There was some significant flaws, which I'll get to at the end of the, my review, but other than those flaws, which I had to dock one star off, I love this novel. And it's still in print, but it's not a book that people are talking about very much in the year 2021. I would like to change that if I could. So, this was McIlvanny's first novel. He was a journalist and he quit his day job and this was the first novel he wrote. It has some flaws and a lot of the energy that you expect from a successful first novel. It's set in a fictional small town in Scotland and the Doherty family lives on High Street, but it's not the High Street that we think of when we think of towns or cities in the UK. It, this High Street in this particular village is the poor part of town, and the novel opens at around the turn of the 20th century with the birth of one of Tam Doherty's sons. And Cam Doherty, who we follow until he's in, in his 20s, in the 1920s, seems to be the autobiographical character, McIlvanny's alter ego. What a fascinating family. So the patriarch is Tam Doherty, and he is a very loving family man, a hard drinker, and a fiery temper. So he is full of flaws and full of love. Just this big-hearted, tempestuous man, an unforgettable character. And his wife, Jenny, is also one of the most... Uh, in, it's been several books ago that I encountered such a complex female ca character written by a man. And theirs is a mixed marriage. He is Catholic, and Jenny, his wife, these are Cam's parents, Jenny is Protestant, and boy, that is a big problem. The dad, he doesn't care. He's not that religious, and he would rather be happy with his Protestant wife and their mixed kids. They raise some of their kids Catholic and others Protestant, but Tam could really give a give a you-know-what about the religion. His father is really upset about it, and the Catholic priest in town is really upset about it, and there's some fabulous scenes about how little Tam Doherty cares about the religious issue early in the novel. And uh, what a bunch of fascinating, flawed men populate this novel, and Jenny, although I don't know, does Jenny have any flaws? She must, but... Um, the men certainly are deeply flawed and fully drawn and, oh my god, the conflict and all the trials and tribulations of being a Scottish man in the early 20th century. They're all here. The outbreak of World War I. Um, it's a family of miners and the, all the dangers and economic injustices of that. It's in many ways a fiercely anti-colonial novel. There's a powerful scene where one of the kids is severely scolded at school for using Scottish words in a school assignment instead of the, the English words. There's a lot of things to sink your teeth into here. Uh, richly drawn characters, emotionally satisfying, big, beautifully rendered scenes. I'm going to read you an excerpt from one of those scenes. There are rivalries between the grandpa, the father, and the three boys, and there's one daughter. A lot of the dialogue is in Scottish diction, and I've read now a handful of Scottish novels. This was one of the ones that had Scottish diction that was the easiest for me to read. There were a few words that I had to look up. They use the verb ken, which is a Scottish and Northern English dialectical word, which means to know. I had to look that up, but most of it, phonetically, I could figure it out, and the dialogue here is so rich. Anything that's not written in dialogue is in standard English. The writing is beautiful. I can't believe I've gotten this many minutes into this review without mentioning the humor. It is not a comic novel, but there are just freaking hilarious moments in here. Also moments of pathos and heart-wrenching moments, but the humor, I'm going to show that in the excerpt. Why don't I get to the excerpt now, Sean? But yes, there are just some deeply funny moments. So this scene is in the early 1920s, and it's Hogmanay, which is a New Year's tradition in Scotland. It's the actually a New Year's Eve tradition, if I understand it correctly. You visit other people's homes, and you welcome people into your homes on Hogmanay. 
so the scene I'm going to read you a short passage from is from Hogmanay at the Doherty families in, an, in the early 1920s. And one of the boys, I think he's reached the age of majority, Angus, and he has been out carousing with some of his buddies, and he brings them home to greet his family for Hogmanay. There is one word that I don't know how to pronounce. I will put it up here. I'm going to pronounce it Ian, but it means eyes. And you need to know that to get the joke, to get the, the pun of what, some of the dialogue coming up. Uh, if anybody knows how you pronounce it, please put a comment in below because I couldn't find any help online. And I can't, for the life of me, fake a Scottish accent, so please bear with me. Angus's friends followed him round the company. They were all respectful enough, but their self-confidence was somehow so gaudy that they couldn't help making the others feel that they were bystanders at a procession. Like the soldiers of an army that has never been defeated, they didn't know how to come into a place without taking it over. They were still finding stray bits of laughter among themselves that must have stayed with them from wherever they had been, like ticker tape caught among their clothes. They contrived innocently to convey the impression that the rest had only been waiting for their arrival. Oh, I can place you now, Jenny said to the young man who was shaking her hand. You're Rab Morrison's boy. No, Alex. Your mother was a McQueen to her own name. That's right, Mrs. Dougherty. And your name's... Rab as well. Good, eh? You're just your father or the back. You couldn't lift one and lay the other. Except for across the Ian, Jenny, Mary Hawkins said. He's got Lizzie McQueen's Ian. He's got her Ian. How's your mother getting on without them, Rab? Angus asked. They all laughed, but Angus and his friends laughed differently, together making a schism of their amusement, a private joke about the quaintness of their parents' generation. The others felt their separateness, each being partly defined by not being one of the vigorous group who wore their smiles like badges. Angus Dougherty, Rab Morrison, Johnny Lawson, and Buzz Crawley seemed to have taken out a joint lease on the 1920s. Khan was impatient with his own youth, feeling a couple of hogmanies behind the place where things were happening. For Jenny and Mary, tracing the features of the parents through the children, it was as if their pasts had been re-let. Kathleen felt she was almost as old as her mother. Mick nursed his arm as if he had just lost it. Jack remembered what he had been like a few years ago, and was glad that they wouldn't be long till they learned. The older men felt that the room was crowded. I mentioned that there's lots of uh, emotionally powerful scenes and events that happen in the novel, and it's devoid of sentimentality. I have a high allergy to sentimentality. I also realize that's a subjective thing, but... I loved the fact that this was an unsentimental novel. However, I have to end it on a negative note and say that there was about 20% of this novel, maybe at the most, 10 to 20% of the novel, that I was unsatisfied with, and this is why. Two kind of related reasons, both of which have to do with the general flaw, which was he had a lot of really colorful characters, and there are some fabulous scenes w with family, a few neighbors, but mostly family, where they're all together that are just riveting and so well done. But McIlvanny also has a bad habit of forgetting about certain characters for way too many pages and then presenting them in a way that kind of silos them. We see them separate. We see them navel-gazing. And those scenes didn't work. Like I say, that's a maximum of 20% of the novel, maybe less, that by the end drove me crazy. Because there's a couple issues in the novel. One is this religious problem, where we see it in a couple big scenes near the beginning of the novel, and then it never comes up again in all of the things going on in the family until there's a funeral at the end of the novel. And I'm not going to give any details about whose funeral or anything, but it was such a big deal. And then not to mention it over the next 15 years of the family life. And then for it to be such a big issue at the end, I thought, hmm, should have dealt with that. And the daughter, Tam and Jenny's daughter, she marries a lovely young man that the parents are so delighted when she brings him around and when they're courting. And then they get married, and we never see them for years 
in the story and pages and pages and pages and by the time we ever see them again their marriage is in tatters and i just thought why why didn't you show kind of a gradual progression like it was just kind of jarring and, I, and again that's maybe first novel flaws getting back to this thing about showing the characters with navel gazing i realize i'm kind of blending them together here but bear with me <laughs> i'm not a professional reviewer when characters have a chapter or a big part of a chapter to themselves McIlvenny's worst writerly habits which seem like they might be understandable for a journalist turned novelist he over editorializes he over explains and he analyzes the characters when the characters are all together he doesn't do that he just shows all this stuff happening and it's so vibrant and vivid but when they're by themselves, he, he just lost me. I'm going to give you a short passage. And this is about his alter ego, Khan, the son of Tam and Jenny. And he is in adolescence now. His maternal grandfather has kicked the bucket. And he's walking in the countryside near the village, revisiting places that his grandpa used to always take him when he was a wee tot. That little area in the countryside, it is called... Bringin, and he's realizing how much he's grown and grown out of the boy he was when his grandpa would show him these magical places in nature or whatever. So I'm going to read that, and this is an example of where the analysis and the navel gazing becomes excessive to me. But these places themselves, like the fantasies in which he had once clothed them, became residual. The lake and the well turned into the past as if they contained slewed selves. As he grew, the bringen, which he thought he had used, had really been using him, had taken over a part of him. Always inclined to be withdrawn, he had allowed himself to become so addicted to the silences of bringen, the shelter of its trees, the languor of its fields, that set against the demands which High Street made on his growing, it caused a conflict in him. Holding him in a vice between them, Bringen and High Street squeezed him into puberty. In his emergence, what was left behind was what Bringen had meant to him. What stayed with him was High Street. Later, when he thought of his boyhood, it was Bringen he would remember. But aging towards work and responsibility within his family, his times in Bringen came more and more to seem like truancy from himself, the person he had to learn to be. Okay, so, I mean, that is not horrible writing. It has some great turns of phrase or whatever, but it's just way too analytical. It's telling me stuff, not showing it to me, and giving you one small quote in isolation isn't going to communicate the fact that the cumulative effect of those passages uh, started to grate on me by the end. However, 80% of this novel, 80 or, 80 or more percent of this novel, I absolutely adored. So... You can be the judge. If you loved the first passage and weren't so bothered by the second one, please try this novel. McIlvany wrote a lot of crime fiction, which is not my jam, but he did write uh, one or two other literary novels, one of which I already have on my shelf, and I do plan to explore his writing more. And I think you should too. Thanks for watching.